Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to Pakistan in Perspective, a special series examining the state of minority and human rights in Pakistan from a historical, legal, and philosophical perspective. In our last program, we explored the specific discriminatory laws that target Ahmadi Muslims in Pakistan and also the denial of the right to vote for Ahmadi Muslims. Today's program focuses on the future. What are the prospects for meaningful reform legally and politically in Pakistan? And joining me in the studio to discuss these matters are two very distinguished lawyers from Pakistan. We have Mr. Abid Hassan Minto, who is a senior lawyer, an advocate before the Supreme Court of Pakistan, and a constitutional law expert. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Minto. We have Mr. Mujibur Rahman, who is a senior lawyer, an advocate before the Supreme Court of Pakistan, and an expert on Sharia law and related matters. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Rahman. We have been discussing from inception until current the state of minority rights in Pakistan and particularly discussing the original foundational and constitutional vision of Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah and where that vision um, has gone. Now in this program we will reflect on the prospects for the future and what has become of that vision and indeed is that vision relevant for the future. We asked several of Pakistan's leading commentators and experts to share their thoughts about this subject. Let's take a quick listen. But ultimately, if Pakistan is to survive and to function as a state and be a place where people can live in peace and harmony, then you have to take, decide that Islam is a personal matter. All religions are personal matters. You want to be Christian, you want to be a Buddhist, you want to be um, um, Hindu, you want to be a Muslim. It's personal choice. Nobody's interference. The state will have nothing to do with it. But if you involve, you know, uh, uh, religion in, in the affairs of the state, then you are bound to to, to degenerate into a, an intolerant society. I think the only type of governance can, that can work in Pakistan is a government that actually says we are going to spend a lot of money educating our people, giving them a better standard of life, providing the basic necessities so that no one suffers unduly. Uh, yeah, we, uh, you have to look at it historically. I think uh, uh, when Pakistan was made, uh, there was no question that the minorities were to be looked after, except for that brief or rather tragic uh, circumstances of the partition where people got killed. Uh, I do not remember uh, in my younger days uh, of being perturbed whether somebody was a Christian or a Hindu, or not even whether somebody was a Shia or a Sunni or a Brailvi or a Diobandi or an MD for that matter. In this whole process of uh, polarization, uh, from my perspective, really got accelerated during the Zia years. And ever since the religious right has gained an upper hand in our affairs. We uh, who are sort of saying the word liberal is now an abused word, those shall we say who are more open-minded and open to ideas and open to the fact that anybody else can have a different faith or a different belief, but that we all are descendants uh, from the same source. We've gone on the back foot. And as the religious right has become more militant and more aggressive, we appear to have become frightened. And so in this era of fear, uh, those forces that, are called, that can be called uh, modern or who look upon Islam as a vibrant and an everlasting religion which can cope with for all centuries to come, 
we are out shouted and so we yesterday before yesterday uh, or a few days ago we heard that a girl who had uh, put in urdu word not uh, wrongly uh, was uh, was uh, was about to be really uh, was she arrested or something happened and then a boy from a seminar lay was trying to uh, bury papers uh, verses of the holy quran and he was beaten up severely so in the culture of violence that now permeates pakistan this violence extends to minorities also and i see no way that uh, of a return to it when i see that the assassin of uh, mr salman tasir is a hero i wonder because uh, Uh, the kind of heroes we adopt really show the kind of people we are this is true that pakistan had liberal government because uh, um, uh, benazir was prime minister twice afterwards and even now ppp is in power but i'm afraid the rulers of pakistan um, are too weak political they lack political uh, support and also they are too afraid of uh, changing that law afraid of the Uh, religious groups extremist groups hardline groups therefore they don't want to touch that and i don't expect that any government will do it in the near future so turning now to you uh, mr minto and talking about the future we know that within pakistan there are voices of courage those who would like to see that these laws and the restrictions on minority rights to be abolished and to be changed but we also note that there is this perhaps growing sense of fear or anxiety about whether that 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 rise in reform would be met with stiff resistance from extreme views w- what are your thoughts about that when well, you're right um, fear actually is the is the dominant factor in these matters uh political parties are afraid of uh, the religious zealots and um, the society generally is afraid of these people they cannot freely talk about these matters and uh, express themselves so much so that um, courts of law who are uh, asked to deal with the cases under the the so called blasphemy laws or the laws concerning a religion they are afraid and the trial courts in particular because they sit in mufassil and they sit in small towns and there the these people go and attend those proceedings in a in a menacing fashion and the result is that the the, the judges by and large and they are overawed they they cannot express themselves freely and they write all sides sorts of uh, foolish judgments in these matters convicting the people but and my experience in the high court has been the, the same um, in certain cases relating to blasphemy both in the matters in which christians were involved and in matters in which amdia were also taken to the court uh, my experience was that the judges wanted to avoid the presence of all these people who came there to overawe the court and whenever they found the 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 in the a, a, a time when the these people were absent they heard the matter and decided it accordingly in all superior courts the death sentences invariably given by the lower courts were overturned if they were not overturned in the high court they were ultimately overturned in the high, supreme court and that gives me hope that there is resistance at some level and intellectual body of uh, people in our society is not all so uh, taken away by, by these people in and then the uh, influence by these people another aspect of this matter has been that the blasphemy law which is the, the popularly the, the 295c the which is called the blasphemy law as originally made by ziaul haq provided for two punishments that was an alternative that sentence as well as the life imprisonment 
That matter was taken to the federal Sharia court, which was again a creation of Ziaul Haq. And the Sharia court pronounced that this was not a correct punishment uh, given in the law. And uh, the only punishment provided by Quran and Sunnah according to their interpretation was death sentence. He, they, in fact, the federal Sharia court went to the extent of saying that this was a hard sentence, which means that it is prescribed by the, the Quran, which is a high controversy amongst the Muslim scholars themselves, whether this is provided by Quran at all or not. Having said that, the Federal Sharia Court has jurisdiction under the Constitution as amended by Ziaul Haq to say that the law be amended according to their interpretation. They gave time to the Federal Legislature and the Provincial Legislatures wherever it was necessary and they said the law be accordingly amended to provide just one cent um, punishment. Nobody amended the law. Now this judgment was given somewhere in the year 1990 or uh, around and up to date no legislature whether it was made a legislature which was under the authority of a military dictatorship or a popularly elected legislature has tinkered with the, the, the provision of law itself. So that again gives me, me some hope that there is some resistance somewhere people don't want to turn and be taken away by this kind of a, of a, of a, um, a, 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 a situation where the, the Malvis prevail over their uh, understanding of the law. And another, another hope, Medical Association in Pakistan refused to attend a punishment of amputation of uh, hand uh, given under the, the, the Hadood laws and they said, this is not our job, and this is unethical, and we will not attend this period. So I have hope in this matter. But this is prim prim primarily the business of the political parties. Liberal political parties, democratic political parties, asking for the vote of the people, wanting to have a democratic society in Pakistan, are in fact required and called upon to take notice of the situation which has come about after Ziaullah's uh, um, insidious uh, 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 handling of the whole society as well as the, the constitution of Pakistan and prepare the people of Pakistan because without preparing the people of Pakistan and changing the mindset and that also in, uh, includes the universities and the colleges and the curriculum and the, the, the syllabi which, uh, which uh, prevail at the moment to change their, their mindset and the, such a step was taken by Pervez Musharraf who otherwise is a, uh, is a person whom we don't appreciate as a military dictator but in the matter of uh, this kind he acted in a liberal fashion, in a democratic so, fashion. Mr. Rahman, we heard from Mr. Minto three examples of what I might refer to as inaction or not, number one, not going forward with a sentence that has been given, a death sentence, uh, refusing to enforce it. And indeed it is true that no one has been executed under the anti-blasphemy laws. Uh, we see it, we hear an example of the federal Sharia court wanting the only punishment to be death, but nevertheless the statute not to be amended to reflect that judgment, and an example of a medical association refusing to act in those manners. But those are examples of a, fa of a, a failing to act in the face of these laws. The question remains, what can affirmatively or positively be done to actually change the laws themselves? You see, I am really fascinated by the insight which Ms. Minto has given today. I never saw it in that light before. But this is a very philosophic outlook. He has not only given three instances. I see them as rays of hope because the levels that he has talked about uh, I will have something to say about the lower level later. But at the judicial level, there is a resistance indicated by not confirming the death sentences. At a legislative le level, there is a resistance, which means the representative of people are not so very keen and outgoing to adopt those laws. Resistance at the legislative level. Then the registral, uh, registration, uh, resistance at the societal level, when the doctor says, I will not be a party to the amputation of hands. 
being immoral or being inhuman. So this resistance is not at one level, but the resistance is not strong enough. That resistance has to be built. Like we, we build up the immune systems. We have dengue favors going on in Pakistan right now. And so the resistance has to be improved. How we do it, we inject something into the body so as to develop the resistance. Mentor Saab has said our polit political parties, our social workers, our intellectuals have to change the mindset. But the mindset is always affected by the legal process. So through all these laws, Sadly, our society is very deeply fragmented. We have to bring the pieces together. And if we start bringing the pieces together by some legislative measures, that will be an easy way going towards that. Now, fragmentation can be done away with by a process of integration. How do you go about that? If you can do away with the joint separate electorate or separate lists and discrimination on the coast, if you can bring the uh, minorities closer to this uh, mainstream in, a, in that integrating fashion, the first effect will be, the first effect of a single voter list will be the level of tolerance will at once go very high because there will be very close interaction between the, those who want to be elected and those who are electors. Electors and the elected will have more frequent uh, exchange and interchange of their thoughts. So the b b level of tolerance will at once go very high. So that will be a process of integration. So the only answer to fragmentation is the integration. And integration, there are many things that can be done. But the easiest way, I think, the easiest law to touch, easiest law to amend, which is we have already gone the halfway. Joint electorate has been eliminated, but in joint electorate we have brought in certain parties and left out one party. So already something has been done. What needs to be done is one electoral vote, one citizenship, no division between the citizens and the citizens. We have to come back to that. In, uh, inclusive approach and that will give a hope to the society I hope then this you see on account of fragmentation the, this uh, uh, terrorism and everything once the level of toleration goes high this terrorism will also go down so we see this this positive resistance which brings us hope for po the prospects of change and and we we understand that in order to empower minorities they, they need to be, you can say, reintegrated or better integrated in society. And that's a societal level change. So alongside that societal level change, uh, Mr. Minto, is there also a prospect or a hope for change legislatively and legally? And in particular, the decriminalization of statutes. Because at the end of the day, regardless if the, whether the death penalty is itself being uh, meted out, there are minorities who are languishing in prisons and waiting many months, even years, for their cases to be adjudicated. Well, um, it is correct that uh, at the end of the day it is the legislative mayor which will uh, improve the situation to a large extent. But to reach that point of uh, the, the history where the legislative mayors can be taken to amend th these kinds of laws, which are uh, discriminatory on the basis of religion and which are the result of uh, fear most of the time um, because the fear has been created by those who are supporting this kind of discrimination. You have to prepare the electorate itself because it's not merely the end product of the people who go and sit in the assemblies who will uh, pass a legislation. If they, they could they, um, pass that legislation, they would have done that. And when the changes came, the first changes came under a dispensation which was not nearly the, the democratic dispensation. That was Pervez Musharraf's time, which, who took away certain matters. And he, was all, he also wavered at the end of the day on the matter of the lists themselves. So that, that has to be supported by the electorate itself. And that is the business of the political parties. So one has to influence the political parties and their leaderships to act according to their manifestos which call for a broad democratic uh, parliamentary system to operate in Pakistan 
that that has to be be actually done and the electorate will be be educated simultaneously because when you take up this matter to the people then the electorate gets educated then you go to the universities and the educational institutions and change the curricula st strong enough with the support and the man man mandate of the people themselves so ma people are the real uh, key to the matter their mindset has to be changed and that mindset can be changed by by a popular political party uh, we have seen in history that has been done in our own history pakistan's history itself when the popular leadership came and it uh, was closer to the, the to the mind of the people and the understanding of the people it was able to take several steps so this has to be done so a grassroots populist movement to create and effectuate meaningful change. A, a very tall order in Pakistan. Uh, Mr. Rahman, you've advocated for the rights of minorities. You've handled many cases. Do you, do you have hope that in light of all of uh, the incidences of violence that we hear about, sectarian strife, that there is uh, prospects that there would be a, a, a populist movement that actually can create change and maybe perhaps restore the original vision of Mr. Jinnah. Well, you see, the popular movements cannot be created by individuals, uh, I mean, ordinary individuals. It needs a, uh, uh, sometime a one man comes in history, that, that is a very tall order. But as Minter, as Minter said, political parties have to be geared up for that. But I have some, uh, some observation to make that somehow or the other, whether it is political parties, whether it is some other media, that fear has to be taken away from the minds of the people. I, I will give an example. Um, I, I never forget the instances of my personal experience. In Mardan, a gentleman was convicted under 298C and I took the appeal to Peshawar High Court. And when I read the judgment, there were blanks in the judgment. And to be clear, 298C, 298. the, the, yeah, the, 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 the gentleman had been charged because on a cash memo on which he issued a receipt to a person, the uh, press from where he brought the cash memo, uh, cash memo, it had printed Bismillah Rahman. So he was charged under 290. So when I took the case to Peshawar High Court and I read the file, and I read the judgment of the uh, session judge or a district judge, whatever it was, he, there were many blanks in it. And when I pointed out to judge that this is not a considered judgment, it was Usman Ali Shah, Chief Justice of Peshawar High Court. He was surprised. He said, all right, we'll adjourn the case. Let the session judge come and explain how it happened. And he came in the court and he explained, sir, what could I do? While I was writing judgment, there was a mob of 5,000 people outside my court shouting. So I immediately got rid of the case. So that kind of fear which is brought up, I mean, my feeling is, my feeling is that the, this uh, extremist lobby has a uh, nuisance value. Even a small group, a 5,000 or 500 people group can make a lot of noise, street power. But the core of our society is not that extremist. The core of that society has to be addressed. And to address that society, as Mr. Mr. points out, Mr. Mr. Uh, points out, we have to gear up the political parties. And political parties will do a better job if we have a joint electorate. I think, uh, I think this is not a very difficult amendment to make. And, and a true, to be clear, a true joint electorate, because yeah. we do understand that President Musharraf restored a joint electorate, but then just a few months later, owing to some pressures, excluded yeah. the Ahmadis yeah. from voting. So in order to vote now, you have to actually say I mean, the, the, the voter list should have nothing to do with religion. Citizen is citizen. So if you can bring all the citizens in, vo in one voter list, Ahmadi, non-Ahmadi, Christian, whoever they are, in one voter list, the interaction between the electorate and the elected will be more vibrant. And therefore, it, it might be easier. And it may be very difficult or touchy to amend the other statutes criminalizing that we have been talking about. But it may be comparatively easier to bring this change, political change. All political parties agree to that. So far as I know, except for some uh, for religious political parties, all parties agree that there should be joint electorate and make it make it meaningful joint electorate. That is the only way we can bre break that barrier and bring the uh, take the fear away from the minds of the people. That fear, as Mr. Naim Bukhari pointed out and my friend pointed out, that at the lower level the convictions are convictions are recorded on account of the fear they have, and that resistance shows itself 
only at the higher level where the uh, where the crowd and the noise is not there higher courts are sitting in uh, their uh, uh, secluded atmosphere so they are more able to give a more balanced and a cool headed judgment so we have to take this fear away and i suggest one thing which we must do is political parties must put their heads together to bring this anomaly to an end single electoral list one citizen one vote and there really is not a matter of religion it's a matter of citizenship at that point that if you are a citizen of pakistan regardless of your religious affiliation you have the full and free right to vote that's right. uh, without restrictions electors. it is the list of the electors and there every elector must uh, appear on that list uh, i may indicate immediately uh, this may be a, a, an easy thing to do in a court of law also provided political support is forthcoming and some political parties are willing to take up this matter where this matter can be challenged and um, because this discrimination is not merely between the mainstream muslims and the ahmadis it's a discrimination between one and, and, and a minority against the other because the other minorities are, uh, are uh, appearing in the list so therefore you are discriminating against one minority against the other minorities also not which, which further further disintegration and creates more strife uh, mr minto when you assess and take stock of 64 years of history of pakistan looking forward you have to look back and we began this series by discussing mr jinnah's vision a vision based on true protections and the empowerment indeed of minorities is that vision relevant and if not how can it be made relevant in pakistan well um, i think that that vision has to be relevant because that is the only vision on the basis of which a pakistan can exist as a modern democratic society and a progressive society so that has to be a living model before us and uh, it's easier on the on that pretext in fact my political group to which i belong has in manifesto that 11th of august 1947 speech should be made as the preamble in, st in, in place of the 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 uh, the uh, resolution of 1949 the objectives resolution we say the objectives resolution should be taken out of the constitution and instead of that uh, that would be a great start mm -hmm. to a future a prosperous future for pakistan that that very grand vision can be reintegrated formally in the constitution of pakistan one can only hope these have been very deep and this complex and fascinating the, issues this Mr. is Rahman, the, your thoughts? this is the only vision for survival the rest in confusion it's not there is no vision otherwise anywhere this is the only vision given by qaid azam mohammad rejna and as mr has pointed out it's it will be a wonderful thing if we can bring it up as a preamble of our constitution well that's all the time we have for today's program it has been certainly uh, an enlightening series uh, pakistan in perspective i wanted to again thank all of our panelists all of our guests all of the commentators we've interviewed uh, this concludes our special series and we hope in the future to have future series on this very important subject. For now, thank you very much.